I want to continue on with what we were talking about on the main show when it comes to Israel. Uh, we went over the South Africa charges against uh, Israel, claiming that they are committing genocide. They are taking them to the International Criminal Court. Um, and the I want to continue on because there's been a couple of comments that have been made. I was reading off some of the comments that they put into their packet of comments made by Israeli uh, government officials. And recently there have been some more comments made. The genocidal comments have not stopped. So this is uh, Finance Minister Bezalel Smotrich and Itamar Ben-Gavir both made some pretty outrageous comments about repopulating Gaza with Israelis and moving all of the Palestinians out of the Gaza Strip. Now, the United States government has come out saying, wait a minute, we don't agree with this. This is not what we like. And then the Israelis came back and said, we don't care what you like, America. I mean, we're friends and all, but not like that good of friends. <laughs> so let's go over what they said. So we're going to start off with Finance Minister Bezalel Smotrich. He said... Um, in a, he said the correct solution to the ongoing Israeli-Palestinian conflict is to encourage the voluntary migration of Gaza's residents to countries that will agree to take in the refugees. Smotrich told members of his religious Zionism party, predicting that Israel will permanently control the territory of the Gaza Strip, including through the establishment of settlements. He also went on to say what needs to be done in the Gaza Strip is to encourage immigration. He told this to Army Radio. He said, if there are 100,000 or 200,000 Arabs in Gaza and not 2 million Arabs, the entire discussion on the day after will be totally different. So we can manage 100 or 200,000 of them. We'll allow that many to stay. That's very similar to the number of Palestinians that are inside of Israel proper. There's about 2 million of them. And they say, well, see, we're not a totally racist society. We have Palestinians here, but they only make up 20 percent. And when they only make up 20 percent, that means they have absolutely no political power whatsoever. And there have been statements made by previous Israeli um, government officials who've said that 20 percent is the magic number. You could have 20 percent minorities in your Jewish state who are not Jewish, and that's OK. You can have 20 percent non-Jews. Then you will still retain a Jewishness to the state. You'll retain the, the character of the state and the power of the state. And you'll also get to point to those minorities and say, see, see, we're not a racist society. We've got others. we got others here. So they're kind of saying the same thing about this 100 to 200,000 Arabs in Gaza. They're thinking that's manageable because they intend on having like a million Israelis living in the Gaza Strip beachfront property. Wouldn't you want to live there? So they're thinking if they get a million to move into that region and there's only 100 or 200,000 Palestinians amongst them, that's 20 percent. That's OK. Certainly can't have the 2.3 million living there now. So he goes on to say that the 2.3 million population were no longer there growing up on the aspiration to destroy the state of Israel, then he said Gaza would seem different, would be seen differently in Israel. And he said that uh, didn't have all those millions of Palestinians there who just wanted to get rid of Israel. Then he said, then Gaza wouldn't be this kind of treacherous place that Israelis imagine. He said, instead, most of Israeli society will say, why not? It's a nice place. Let's make the desert bloom. It doesn't come at anyone's expense, he says. So people will be enticed to move to Gaza if the 2.3 million Palestinians are not there. Now, Ben Gavir went on to say on Israel's Channel 12 that, that his right, his wife's right, and his children's right to walk through the streets of the West Bank was much more important than Arabs' right to movement and travel, he said. He said, excuse me, Muhammad. But this is the reality. This is the truth. My right to life outweighs your right to move on the streets. So sorry about, you know, you, you don't get any freedoms because my right to just live is, is bigger than your right to freedom. Not realizing that stripping these people of their freedom is what's causing you, your life, to be at risk. He goes on to say, um, he actually said this in a speech and then he put it in a tweet. And he said, uh, we must promote the solution to encourage the migration of Gaza's residents. This is a correct, just, moral, and humane solution. We have partners around the world that we can help. Encouraging the migration of the residents of Gaza will allow us to bring home the residents of the Otaf and residents of Gush Katif, which are uh, settlements that were moved out of Gaza. When Israel withdrew from Gaza in 2006, they forced a lot of the settlements, the settlers, to leave the Gaza Strip. And... Uh, because they knew what they were going to be doing to the Gaza Strip, which was turning it into a giant ghetto. 
So they forced them to leave. And now he's saying that we're going to bring them home. They're going to they're going to be allowed to come back so they can go home to the settlements they had in Gaza. But the Palestinians can't go home to the whole of the land of the Holy Land of, of ancient Canaan. They can't go back to that land and live amongst everybody. They should all be able able to roam free. That is my opinion of the situation. I think that they all need to be allowed to roam freely all across the region, all of them, Israelis and Palestinians, together in one land. And there would be 7 million Israelis. There would be 7 million Palestinians. It would be 50-50. They would have to share government. They would have to share power. I believe that they could do this. It would be rocky. I do think there would be violence for a couple of generations. But then things would level out if there's a rule of law and if all that commit acts of violence on either side are held to account. If there's true justice and fairness, then I think that it would calm down and people would start living amongst each other just fine. In fact, Israel once again continues to point out those two million Palestinians living inside of Israel. They're not complaining of terrorist attacks. Those people are given full rights and freedom and they're allowed to go anywhere they want. Uh, they don't have the same exact rights. They don't have the same exact community rights as the Jewish people do. But for the individual, the basic individual a Palestinian Israeli has the same individual rights as another Israeli for the most part. They don't have the same national rights. Uh, they can't, for example, an Israeli Jew can marry a Jewish person anywhere in the world and bring them to come live in Israel, somebody who's never been there at all. A Palestinian Israeli, on the other hand, could marry somebody 20 minutes away in the West Bank whose family home was right there where Israel is today and they cannot bring them into Israel to live with them. So they, do, they don't have the same, you know, the, the rights are targeted against the Palestinian people as a whole, but they do have the same individual rights in their day-to-day -day life. And guess what? Where's the violence? They're always pointing out those 2 million Palestinians living there, and they're saying it's peaceful, it's peaceful. Well, why can't you then integrate everybody and keep it peaceful? You can do that. Crack down on the extremists on both sides. Crack down on the extreme settlers. Crack down on Hamas. You could do that and keep it fair and everybody lives together peacefully. You probably would not be able to call it Israel anymore. You'd probably have to call it Canaan uh, or Canaan or the Holy Land. Um, or you could call it Israel-Palestine or Palestine-Israel. I don't know. I don't care what you call it. But it's got to be a fair society for all. And that is, I think, what most of us have gotten to the point of. That's the only real path forward. There, no other path is really truly fair or just. Even, I believe it was during the Ottoman rule, actually, when there were the three groups, there was a larger Christian presence living in the Holy Land. The Christians have largely been driven out, but by, and the Christian Palestinians will tell you it was the Israelis that drove them out. It wasn't the Muslims. Um, but there was, you know, all three groups living there. And I believe the way the Ottomans divided it up is they said, okay, you all live there under kind of a general, there's like a general law, but then you're each under the command of your own leadership. Like you have your own laws for your group and your group has its own. And, you know, there's like their own administrations and their own laws. And it's kind of a creative and interesting way to solve the diversity that is in the Holy Land. And there should be more diversity. It really should not just be, in my opinion, 7 million Jews and 7 million Palestinians. Uh, there should be Christians in the region as well. They should be allowed to come back and immigrate back to the Holy Land and enjoy the birthplace of Jesus and all of the things that they believe for Jesus Christ. I think that that should be allowed as well. And the three groups need to share the land and maybe come up with an interesting solution like how they ruled it in the past with different, you know, there was an overall law that everybody had to agree to and overall shared resources and security. But then after that, either that or bring in the Buddhists who don't care about any of it at all, <laughs> just completely neutral. Just bring in the Buddhists and have them run everything and have them say, OK, none of you guys can get along. So we're going to we're going to like Zen the place out and everybody's going to get along now and we're going to keep the peace. I don't know. we got to come up with a, a creative solution to the region. But what is happening now in this idea of splitting the land between Palestinians and Israelis and everybody living separately is not working, mostly because the Israelis will not allow it with their settlement building in the West Bank and their determination to to get that beachfront property in Gaza. Um, the State Department, let's move on here. The State Department uh, called out the the Ben Gavir and the Smotrich uh, statements saying that these guys are nuts, right? So 
The State Department said, uh, here's Matthew Miller, he said, the United States rejects the inflammatory and irresponsible statements from Israeli ministers, uh, Smotrich and Ben Gavir. There should be no mass displacement of Palestinians from Gaza. But then Ben Gavir responded. This is how the Israelis are. This is why I say my opinion is the United States has lost all power in this. There was a time when the United States was more powerful than Israel. We were giving them a lot of money. They were really dependent on it. But now I believe that the Israeli lobby is more powerful. There's more money going to the, the politicians in Washington from the Israeli lobby. than there is American money flowing into Israel, and they now control us in a lot of ways. Um, but Ben Gavir responded, and he says, I appreciate the United States very much, but with all due respect, we are no longer a star on the American flag. Not really sure what that means. No longer a star on the American flag. You never were. You never were. The United States is our dear friend, but we will do what is best for the state of Israel. Immigrate hundreds of thousands of Gazas will allow the residents of the Gaza Strip settlements to return to their homes and live in safety and will protect IDF soldiers. So Israel is doubling down and saying, mm, thanks, but no thanks. We don't really care what you have to say, America. Thanks, but no thanks. So, um, yeah, okay. They are dead set to do what they want to do, and they really do not care what the United States says. So we'll see how this goes. It is, it is really about time, though. I mean, uh, I, it's, it's about time the United States just says, okay, then, we're not going to allow you to continue doing what you're doing. We're cutting you off. But I think that would humiliate the government because I really believe that the power the power is shifted. Uh, a lot of people disagree with me on this. I had this conversation last night with Trita Parsi on the show, and he believes that, no, the United States still wields the stick. A lot of other people, my dad was saying that. He thinks that he's, he agrees with Trita that the United States still wields the stick. I think we lost it. I think that Israel now wields the bigger stick in American politics. And I think that American politicians are afraid of Israel's lobby. And I think that they know that they will lose their campaigns. If you go to APAC's website, they even tout how they get like 97 or 98 percent of their candidates win their elections. So they have a lot of power. They have a lot of power. So let's talk about this. The Hamas leader was taken out in Beirut. Um, this has been making the big news all day today that the leader was they they wiped him out with a drone. Um, the thing about this that I look like Hezbollah is not likely to respond to this. This is not going against their particular red line. Hezbollah is about Lebanon and protecting Lebanon. Um, taking out this Hamas leader inside of Beirut is something that they're, they're probably very uh, concerned about, the fact that Israel was able to do this or even dared to do it. But I don't think that this is going to widen the war. However, what this does bring out is... This leader is, was sitting in Beirut. That is not Gaza. They are leveling Gaza, and they know that these leaders are not in Gaza. And they say that they're out to destroy Hamas, yet you've got these leaders for Hamas who are being interviewed, and they're sitting in Abu Dhabi, or they're sitting in uh, Beirut, or they're wherever they are. And you know that the Israeli military, you know that their intelligence knows exactly where these leaders are. And you know that they would be able to take them out or assassinate them as they've been doing, as they take out Iranian generals or they take out Hamas leaders in various areas around the Middle East. They have the capacity to do this. So they, why then, except we all know the answer, why then are they then bombing and leveling Gaza and terrorizing the Palestinian people when they know that their leaders aren't even there, that their leaders are sitting in Beirut? If they know that, then why in the world are they bombing the hell out of Gaza? Well, because the, the goal is not really to debilitate Hamas. If they really wanted to get rid of Hamas, they would just target the leadership and be done with it and say, we took out the people responsible for October 7th. We got our revenge on the people who were absolutely responsible. Uh, that would be the fair and just thing to do completely. And I think they have every right to do that. I do think Israel had every right to respond to October 7th by making the people responsible pay. But that's not what they did. What they did was they made everybody pay. They made all the Palestinians pay, and they used it as an opportunity to march in a genocide in order to clear the land so they could take the land. It was just an opportunistic moment for them where they could say, oh, we've been wanting the Gaza Strip back for two decades now. Now it's our time to go take it. That is, that's the issue with what happened 
uh, with, with what's happened since October 7th. Had they just gone after Hamas uh, leadership and, and targeted these guys who were sitting on camera doing interviews, I think that many of us would have said, well, yeah, I mean, what do you think is going to happen to you? I think that they had every, I think that they should uh, and have every right to hobble Hamas and even uh, even take Hamas somehow out of power in in Gaza somehow not the definitely not the way that they're doing it but I do think that you know Israel created the monster nobody learns when it comes to the Middle East we have been so responsible for creating so many of the various different terrorist organizations in the Middle East from because we were arming them sneakily helping them because we wanted to fight the Russians or whatever it was and it turned into Al Qaeda right and then and then turned into ISIS and Israel did what they did, and it turned into Hamas the way that Hamas is. I think uh, clearly the strategy that the strategy of propping up your enemy, hoping that it will keep them weak, is not a working strategy. Hopefully, everybody's learned that lesson. Doubtful. But then beyond that, it's a, a how do we then debilitate those regions? The right way to do it in a lot of ways is to build up the communities around them to where there's no there's no desire for the young people to be recruited into these terrorist organizations. You take a kid that's got college and uh, education and opportunities and businesses and marriage and children, and they're not gonna wanna join a militant organization to go fight. But you take a kid who has none of those opportunities and you go and you say to them, look, you have nothing. You have no family either, by the way, because they killed your family. You have no opportunities because they've taken all your opportunities. You have no ability to have any wealth because they won't allow us any resources to economically build. Join us. We're going to fight the oppression. And they say, OK, I'm with you. It's so easy to recruit. So the way to counter that is to ensure that the people have something better to do than to become militants. That's how you do it. But of course, that's never been the strategy. We don't want them to build up. We don't want them to be powerful. But I, I do think that Israel had, you know, after October 7th and even prior to that, and many in the Palestinian side don't like Hamas. They don't want Hamas, but they just see no other hope for them as a people anymore towards, you know, they've tried everything. They've tried diplomacy. They've tried peace. They've tried moderates. They tried liberal. They've tried everything and none of it worked. So a lot of them have said, well, we never tried these crazy right wing extremists yet. So maybe they'll get it done. Maybe they'll get the job done. So that's kind of what has caused people to turn towards Hamas, but largely the Palestinian people don't really support Hamas or the ideology. They're not um, trying to build some religious caliphate. They just want freedom. So there is a, um, there, th there's maybe a strategy there that could have been implemented to debilitate Hamas, take out their leadership, uh, and then tell the Palestinian people and, and really bribe them, essentially, bribe Gaza and say, if Hamas is in power, we're not giving you the resources. We're going to give you a bunch of resources, however, if we put back in the Palestinian Authority or something like that. And that would have been a way to have to, to eradicate Hamas, hold the people accountable for October 7th without causing a genocide. But they've instead, it, but that's not the goal. The goal wasn't really to get rid of Hamas, it's to get rid of all the people so that they could have the land. So it's moot. Um, but just bringing up the fact that they've been able to take out this Hamas leader in Lebanon, sitting in Lebanon, while they bomb the people in Palestine, uh, in Gaza. And that just goes to show what the real true motivation is in that.